Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Turner and I direct the China Environment Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is a DC based think tank that focuses on foreign policy issues. I'm one of like 21 projects and programs and I often say that I have the best job in Washington DC because my work focuses on China energy and environmental issues. We've expanded more also into Asia, other Asian countries right now doing a lot on uh, uh, research and publications and webinars focused on stemming the tide of plastics in Southeast Asia and China. And today I'd like, I'm really super excited to welcome you to our inaugural CEF green tea chat. And I have my green tea, some nice oolong. And today I'm gonna to be first speaker ever. So we're gonna do good at this, right, Neil? So it's, it's Neil right. Tangri from Gaia. Um, he's the science and policy director there. So Gaia is a global network of 800 organizations working towards zero waste. He's a climate scientist and oceanographer by training. And what I like about, well, what I like about you, Neil, is that you've been boots on the ground working with municipal governments on waste issues. You've done air pollution, water pollution, but also you kind of hobnob or maybe advocacy in some ways at the international level um, with, with a whole range of issues. I mean, climate issues, climate finance, but my interest in chatting with you today because you've done a lot of work on plastics and on waste management. I started kind of doing my dumpster diving about three years ago at the China Environment Forum, looking at starting with sludge in China, sludge to energy, got into food waste. And then once you start doing that, then it's, it's all over. You have to start looking into plastics. And so then I mentioned, I already have this project. And what the reason I wanted to do these tea chats, not only because I love drinking tea with people, but because I wanted to, to, to dive even deeper into a topic. And so I just want to start off. Do you want to say hi to everyone? <laughs> well, hello, everyone who's out there. It's uh... It's an honor to be here and uh, very happy to help you inaugurate your series. Yes, yes. So first question, a little bit, kind of like a little bit about who's this guy and what's he doing? Yeah. Um, so I'd like you to tell us a little bit about, you know, what Gaia is and, and, and particularly what you're doing around plastic waste. Sure. So <clears throat> Gaia is a, as you mentioned, a global network of over 800 organizations in 90 countries. Um, and our members range from uh, small local grassroots organizations to uh, na national networks themselves of organizations, as well as some individual members. And uh, the thing about waste, particularly municipal waste, which is what we mostly work on, is that, of course, it's a universal issue. And it's, uh, I should say, it's a universal problem. Um, so we have an approach that really focuses on zero waste. Um, and that means that we are, we approach it the way, <clears throat> say the airline industry approaches accidents, which is if you have waste in your system that is going to a, a, an incinerator or a landfill, then you've got a systemic problem that needs to be fixed. Um, there are too few material resources on the planet and there's too much um, pollution involved from climate pollution to toxics for us to accommodate that kind of waste. Well, and but in your name, the one spelled out, I mean, Gaia yes. alone is beautiful. It's Mother Earth, Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. And so a lot, yeah. yeah. So a lot of the organizations, uh, you know, I don't think most people wake up in the morning and say, gee, I really want to work on municipal waste today. Um, but when you find that someone's going to build an incinerator in your backyard or maybe a toxic waste dump, then yes, you get pretty interested in the issue. And you know that you don't want to live next to that. Um, you don't want it in your town. Of course, nobody else wants it in their town either. And then you start saying, ah, right. So what should we be doing with this? And there's no good thing to do with waste once it's become waste. So the most important thing is to get upstream and redesign our entire materials economy so that we're not producing so much waste at the end. And so I like that you said upstream because a lot of times like some of the lingo that and when we talk in waste, you have your waste stream. Yes. So upstream from production yes. to use and what happened, you know, or pre or post consumer upstream, downstream. I like the thinking of it like the plastic pipeline. And so, right. so, so you're saying we're not just interested just in the, the downstream waste management, but of course you do do some work there. I mean, you're interested in maybe stopping the incineration, um, but maybe, maybe a little bit more pro pro recycling for us. It well, and you know, recycling is still sort of a post-consumer intervention, and it's a very important one um, to return materials to the economy. But I think that the most ambitious solutions lie 
before anything ever comes to the consumer. So they're in the design and the production and the raw materials decisions. And a lot of it's about product and packaging design. Like think about all the stuff that we make. Is it made to be recycled? Is it made to be disassembled and reassembled into new products? Is it, um, or is it made to be used and then thrown out? And I think that's where the most influential decisions are made. So you're saying that, so in your mind, I mean, the plastic problem is not just it's not really waste management. It's more the production. I mean, upstream. Yes. But see, what's in, this morning I had a meeting um, with some folks from Japan, UK, and China. We were talking about expanded polystyrene. So, and I learned that I'm not supposed to call it styrofoam. It's EPS. But we focused on what's what's where, how the problem of it in with the fishing communities and what's and with boats, and and in China and and Japan and in a lot of countries they're mainly focused on the collection. Japan does an insane amount of, um, I mean, in a good way, I guess, that they, they capture about 90% of the styrofoam that they produce, not just on the marine side, but also in the uh, food, you know, fast food boxes and things. And they either recycle or burn 90%, which is pretty impressive. I mean, compared to the amount, you know, I mean, we don't, I don't think we come anywhere near close to that in the United States, but that's not, but th that's kind of where they seem to be right now is just right. so, capturing it before it gets into the ocean. So a lot of the, public interest in the last couple of years has really been focused on plastics in the ocean, right? And I think we've all seen the images and we've seen the statistics about, um, you know, the amount of plastic that's out there, whether it's uh, like plastic bags that are being mistaken for jellyfish and being eaten by sea turtles, or it's microplastics that are plastics that are broken down and are actually too fine to even see, but they get taken up in the food web and then they could end up on our plates. But only about 1% of plastic waste actually ends up in the ocean. So that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, and it's a huge problem in it, as it is in uh, marine plastics. But the plastic, uh, plastic is a much more problematic product over its whole life cycle. So it has a huge carbon footprint. Plastic is a product of the oil and gas industry. Um, and it's a... Uh, it's it's the largest growing sector of the oil and gas industry. So as we look at phasing out uh, gas automobiles and bringing in uh, electric automobiles, and people are starting to think about what does uh, electric aviation look like and all of these other things, the oil and gas industry says, ah, petrochemicals is where our growth is, and petrochemicals largely means plastic. So there's a huge carbon footprint there. There are terrible toxic emissions and effluent that come out of those uh, refineries and um, uh, you know the, and the plastic manufacturing facilities and that burden is really borne by the communities that live next to them so <clears throat> there's a whole you know part of Louisiana and Texas that's called cancer alley because these communities are breathing in, uh, the emissions that result from all of this plastic and petrochemical production. So there's a fair then, amount. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, so then there's the use phase, right? So we all use plastic every day in our lives. Um, most of that plastic has not really been studied for what are the health impacts. So there are rapidly rising concerns in the scientific community about the migration of, uh, of plastics or sometimes the additives in plastic into our food, for example. Um, and then there's the disposal. So what do you do once you are done with your plastic wrapper or your EPS food container? Where does it go? Even if you have a very efficient waste management system that captures that so it doesn't end up uncontrolled blowing off into the ocean, there's no particularly good thing to do with it. Um, landfilling is relatively inert if you can be assured that you're not uh, starting a landfill fire, but um, it's, you know, nobody wants to live next to a landfill either. Um, and incinerators sort of just metabolize all that pollution and put it up into the air. I, I thought I was, no, that's great. So, cause again, our conversation today is, is you were really diving into like the whole supply chain and some of the challenges. And when you mentioned about the science, I actually have got um, 
a handful of uh, PhD students at, at Duke and some people in their network who are writing some blogs for me. And one woman is actually studying um, sea anemones and, and, and how, you know, they're really concerned about the, the additives, you know, so, so it's, so, you know, and some other guys looking at whale blubber and just seeing how it's being absorbed because the science is actually not that clear yet. We, I mean, we know that like in fish, it gets mainly, it ends up in their organs. So if you're just eating fish flesh, it's maybe not as bad for you. Oysters, we have, you know, the world is your oyster and it's got plastic in it. Um, yeah. So that, that oysters, it's the whole kit and caboodle. But there's still a lot of, you know, but but is, but is this, a, you know, you know, do we need to wait for the science to tell us that this is not good? That is exactly what we talk about is that there is a precautionary principle. Uh, it has been enshrined in law in the European Union, unfortunately, not in the U.S. yet. And it says that where there is scientific uh, doubt about something, then you take the right route of precaution uh, and certainly when we're talking about uh, additives, phthalates, um, you know, uh, say brominated flame retardants, which are added to a lot of plastics, there are certainly a lot of questions about the health impacts there. There's a lot of uh, strong evidence already that there are significant impacts. But you know, if you start producing something in the year 2000, and then you're waiting to see when what's the cancer risk? Well, you have to expose many thousands of people to that for a few decades. And by then you've done the damage, right? So if we wait until all the evidence is in, then really it's closing the barn door after the horse is left. Okay, well, and before I ask my next question, I should remind people that are watching this live that you can, you can tweet Wilson CEF, or if you look on the webinar at the very bottom, there's an email to Rui to send a question in so I can ask him live. Now, this is your chance. You can ask these questions now. And if you don't, call, well, I'm gonna keep asking you questions until they, they hopefully some people chime in. Um, so, so, let's, so let's switch over a second to the, you know, the solution space. I mean, um, that, so I'm in, I'm in DC. I'm actually in Maryland, but that's okay. I, <laughs> I work in DC, which is a real, I'm at a think tank, policy wong town. So of course we think we need better policy. Um, and and we've seen in the, I've seen in the States that you know, in the US, you have Maine that's passed an Enhanced Producer Responsibility Act, or they're close to passing it. There's, a, there, there's kind of a hodgepodge of action at the, the county state level. Maryland, the very first state that has banned expanded polystyrene, <laughs> gotta keep remembering to say that correctly, but it's, it's not everything, but actually my county did it before then. Um, so, so there's the policy solutions, there's some bills up on the hill, but then there's also maybe entrepreneurship. I mean, there's a lot of companies that are, that are, and scientists that are coming up with alternatives. Um, we're yeah. going to say do everything probably, but can, can guide us a little bit in, in terms of thinking, because this problem is so big, you know, you know, and if you're talking to some people up on the hill or in the state houses, you know, where do they begin? Right. So it is really big. Um, the other thing is, though, to remember that it's really recent. So we didn't have a huge plastic pollution problem a couple of decades ago because we weren't making nearly as much plastic. This material has become dominant in our lives in a very short period of time. So there are a lot of uh, ways in which we could simply go back to the way we were doing things before and be better off. Um, so. When I was a kid, I took my lunch to school in a metal lunchbox. And that lunchbox, despite all the abuse that a small boy can put on it, which is considerable, would last at least a year or two. Now, if I go to buy something for my daughter, I can't find a metal lunchbox because they're all plastic. Uh, so there's a lot of ways in which plastic is, uh, and they don't last any longer. They last less time. You know, and then course, you have to go buy a new one because you can't really repair plastic. Um, so there are a lot of ways in which plastic has taken over functions that really we don't need it for. Um, and it's done that because it is cheap. It is cheap because it is subsidized indirectly right, through the whole oil and gas industry. And because it doesn't pay for the climate impacts, it doesn't pay for the cleanup costs, um, the, the Industry that produces the plastic doesn't pay the municipalities who have to collect all of that plastic and find somewhere to put it, right? So it's a huge financial burden on local government. Um, 
that has been a very clever way of industry kind of outsourcing its responsibilities. Um, so there's a lot um, that can be done at the policy level. Of course, in the United States, we have this, uh, we have pretty decentralized policy, as you were saying. So um, a lot of these build up at the kind of city level first, and then we start to get uh, state level action, and that hopefully lays the, the groundwork for federal action. And then beyond that, there is actually an international process now to discuss creating a new binding treaty on plastic. And that is a conversation that's happening under the United Nations Environment Assembly. So a number of countries uh, are pushing very hard. In fact, we have a majority of the members of the UN Environment Assembly who want to see a global uh, legally binding treaty to control plastic over its entire life cycle, not just the waste management phase. Um, and I'm <clears throat> sorry to say, but it won't surprise international observers that the United States is the primary roadblock there. And so, you know, that is something where we hope to see a change in policy. Well, just real quick to insert, because I'm starting to get some questions. But so, but on the U.S., I mean, we there are some bills up on the Hill, Save Our Seas Act 2.0, with passing yes. and a lot of that's focused on marine debris looking at some of the topics we talked about this morning with my group of folks about you know fishing industry maybe get the nets are also made of plastic the ways to incentivize the collection reuse etc um there's also you know so there, there's the recover act the recycle act and then there's the break free from plastic act that's is i guess right. it's going to be reintroduced and i've heard um through the grapevine from folks that this spring there's going to a lot of state houses are going to start introducing more state level legislation on plastics. And so, um, I mean, there's a lot of, you may have noticed there's a lot of contention in terms of just policy making in general right now in the US, right. but, but in terms of environmental stuff, I mean, is this, is this, is this the good approach? Like, the, like with the states, I mean, I don't know if this is gonna be a patchwork attempt, but with the states kind of being little laboratories of experimentation on what's acceptable or doable on policy? <laughs> I mean, I think to some extent that's always the way we do things, and um, I'm not sure why it wouldn't work as well for plastics as anything else. I think there are some concerns about uniformity. You know, certainly the biggest one I would say is if we're trying to change individual behavior, then it's important that we have uniform systems. Um, so uh, to your list of bills, I would ask, uh, add the Zero Waste Act, uh, which- Sorry, I uh, that. Bar. That's all right. Uh, but that's, um, that's got a very nice mechanism in there by which the producers of plastic packaging who are selling these things into the market then have to take financial responsibility for them by paying into a fund that funds local recycling programs. Uh, so that's a, a kind of a mechanism that both disincentivizes the creation of single use plastics as well as funds the recycling programs that, that pick them up. And, um, and obviously yeah. in the US, we're seeing this kind of action because where do, what do I focus on in my work? China, right? They had their the national store policy two years ago that said, we're not taking right. your plastic anymore. And it's been a global game changer. I mean, it's affecting you know the, the, the markets on trading, but to be honest, we never even used to send that much of our plastic to China. To be, it was a lot, but I mean, you know, what we put in our recycling bins still is not that much. Um, in fact, on the recycling question, well, um, just got uh, someone, Kay Primrose, uh, just tweeted in a question. I don't know the affiliation, but um, he, she, said the NPR recently did an expose on how the oil gas industry promotes recycling, knowing it's impractical to sell plastic. What would Neil say in response to the premise that recycling is ultimately futile? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to imagine a world with a major reduction in plastic? I think assuming like, like, like can, right. we can't recycle our way out of it, but is, you know, is there still a place for we, it? Yeah, we can't recycle our way out of it, but I would also not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I think that it's, um, and maybe you're imagining a plastic baby in a plastic bath, but- um, I saw a metal bathtub. <laughs> there you go. Metal bathtub, plastic baby. Uh, no. Anyway, um, I'll try not to mix my metaphors too much. So certainly a reduction in plastic production is possible and is by far the most important um, 
element of any kind of sustainability strategy in plastic. Right now, plastic production globally is growing between three and a half and 4% per year, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but I have to tell you, I, you know, I wish my retirement account was growing that fast. It's, it is an extremely rapid growth and the industry is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into new facilities to maintain that growth. And of course, once they build a new petrochemical complex, it's going to be around for a half a century or more. Um, we don't need all that plastic. The reason they're building that is not to meet demand. They are building that because they don't have another anything else to do that's going to earn them money with all of the uh, ethane that's coming out of natural gas fracking in the United States in particular. So they're actually at this point practically giving away the ethane, which is the feedstock for plastic, um, for the cost of transport, you know, um, and that and then they're going out and developing markets so that people can use more plastic. So we absolutely need to get that under control. And we I believe we can. And as long as we have plastic in society, then we need to recycle it because recycling plastic is a lot better than say landfilling it and then making new plastic to replace it. Yeah, and, and what's, what's, what's fascinating for me, because um, we're doing a lot of research on what's happening in China, because once they close the doors, you know, before it was actually a lot, I don't know if you know, you probably know this, a lot of small and really small and medium sized, almost cottage industry that was recycling a lot of the plastic that they were importing. And so now, then, now they want to get. They've gotten rid of a lot of those small ones, and they're basically reinventing their entire waste management system and, and building it. it. Used to be a private sector thing. They're still promoting the, the private sector, but really trying to build up recycling. Um, but also the incineration. Um, um, Hazel Lee just sent me uh, an email that said, in China, the Development Reform Commission, Ministry of Finance, and Energy Bureau, they've they kind of published a kind of notice that in um, this past September, that waste incineration is seen as a biomass power generation that enjoys subsidies. You don't get it forever, but it's seen as a way, you know, waste to energy. And China has a goal of, of burning at least 50% of not just plastics, but all their municipal waste. Because they, I mean, the world's a populated country and, and you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I have to, I, at the top of my head, I should know this, but you know, the plastic growth trend in China, I think is probably even faster. I mean, particularly under yes. COVID with the, 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 the food delivery packaging. Um, so, you know, and so she was kind of wondering like, what is, you know, how do you see Gaia's work or people in your network in, in China kind of what, what could they be doing, you know, to. So we do have a lot of members in China. Um, China, China is a big complex dynamic place. I don't need to tell you. Um, so I'm a little bit hesitant to make uh, broad brush generalizations. I will say that there was a big push to build a lot of incinerators because they were simply being overwhelmed by the amount of municipal waste that they had. Um, and I, there's already a sense that they're probably overbuilding and that um, they, in fact, some of those like in Japan are just going to end up idle because they're, they're waste, they're not generating that much waste. Then of course, there's the question of, well, did they really need to build all those incinerators in the first place? Um, the, uh, you know, the, a, a, as you know, China has a very active civil society and, and protest movements, particularly when it comes to local air pollution. And incinerators are one of the primary um, kind of flashpoints that have sparked unrest and, and uh, protests in China. And so, because, you know, they're so polluting. So I think um, the Chinese government having invested a few billion in incinerators is now starting to think twice. And they've certainly, they've started this pilot program in Shanghai, which is a, a source separation program at uh, the household level. And they're talking about rolling it out to, I think 32 other cities with World Bank funding. Um, and of course, once you source separate, then you don't have waste. Then you have organics, which can be composted. You have paper or metals, which can be recycled. And yes, you do have some plastics, which can be recycled. And of course, the plastics that can't be recycled are precisely the ones that you have to ask, well, why are we making these in the first place? 
Yeah, and and China is actually. I mean, what what's what's really fascinating is that you know, I mean, China that you have uh, Hainan province this morning, they were telling us that by 2023, I think it was, they said they wanted to get rid of all single use plastics. Then, you know, Han Han and her colleagues said, eh, it might be hard for us to do that. But there's, there's, this, there's this interesting, you know, I mean, it's, it's aspirational, you know, goals to go to start getting rid of single use plastics because the Chinese public is starting to see. And it's not that, I guess you don't want to put, you seem to imply, you don't want to put all this burden on the individuals. Um, but, and, and, and also when you mentioned Shanghai, I mean, this is a very strict waste sorting program. Um, it's not the only one, there's 46 cities doing these experiments. And I've heard of like in Fujian um, that they, in, uh, there, there's, you know, there's some of the cities there, they have more community-based sorting, kind of working with the public. So not quite as authoritarian in terms of, you know, having cameras that recognize your face and people inspecting your track. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's how they're, solution that they're seeing. What about um, in other parts of Asia, some other kinds of work that, that Guy is doing on the plastic waste front? So a lot of uh, what we've been doing recently has to do with uh, the waste trade because um, there's, as you said, after uh, China imposed national sword, a lot of this play, uh, waste plastic ended up in other countries, in Thailand and Indonesia and Malaysia and the Philippines. Um, and so we have been working with our local members in those countries to expose that and in many places to create either to, to ban the import of plastic waste um, or to you know, send those, those shipments back because many times they're, they're actually illegal. Um, they're coming in, they're misdeclared as something else other than plastic waste. And uh, there is an international treaty, the Basel Convention, which most countries around the world, with the exception of the US is a party to, um, that has now placed much stricter limits on the international shipments in, um, in plastic waste. So we're working with our members to transpose those international law so that to really give them teeth, we want to see kind of uniform standards and reporting um, and we're also using that moment to leverage this question of, well, nobody wants to be the dumping ground for another country's plastic waste. But let's talk about what's domestically generated as well. And so there you're starting to see initiative, as you said, for phasing out single use plastics. Um, I think we also need to get more creative about the design phase, as I was saying at the beginning, like why are we creating these multi-material, multi-polymer packages with all these additives that effectively can't be recycled? So that I think is the next um, frontier is talking about um, what can we do at the design phase to ensure that whatever we produce in fact can make it back into a circular economy. So it's a system problem and you're talking, so there, there's no green bullet to solve right. it all. But again, but the design issue, is there is there some kind of some, can you give an example, maybe just, you know, because um, we talked a lot about the policy, about local, international. What about some entrepreneurship, business entrepreneurship out there? I mean, alternative products. I have a, someone writing for it that we, we did an interview and we'll be posting it on a blog soon about people that they're growing yep. textiles out of mushrooms. <laughs> right. So there's, um, yeah, there's actually a report out by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation called Reuse. Um, mm -hmm which spotlights different businesses whose business model is really about reuse rather than uh, single use. Um, and so, you know, we've got everything from alternative food delivery to, um, you know, bring your own coffee cup to the cafe, you name it. Yep. Uh, I can't believe it. My tea time's over. My tea's still not quite, still a little warm, but, um, I got to thank you. And also, um, you know, this is uh, just acknowledge too that this, I get to um, do my plastic dumpster diving with support from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. Um, this has been awesome. I and I'm definitely going to do more of this. And I want to bring people from different sectors in to talk about the plastic issue because I'm looking for partnerships and innovation. And it seems like that's what you guys are doing. Part, you know, yeah. innovations with communities and building new kinds of relationships with business and government. So. Thank you so much for coming today, Neil. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. All right, finish your tea.
Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for coming to this to our CEF Green Tea Chat. Bye bye.